Welcome to another episode of Dari Demoga Urka Taskate Kudasai Watashiwa Padukastu Toshite Tensei Sariti Kita So close So close We almost had it Fucking Degaruda episode five Welcome oh. on, everybody How you doing? <sighs> I'm hurting after my book. Ah my goodness, I am hurting after my book. Um, I know Rapture's hurting from his book. My, so I've actually had to downgrade somebody uh, close to me who who I I once thought of as a friend, and they've now been made an acquaintance for recommending this book to me. <sighs> Damn, <laughs> that's very harsh. All right, so it, it's not once I get to talk about the book. All right, all right, all right, all right. Say, I feel bad now because you know my book was amazing. Mm -hmm. It just took over my life for a fucking week, and all I did was just binge the entire series. Meanwhile, the book I I read was uh, a punch to the gut every other chapter, and there are seventy six chapters in that book alone. Jesus. But um, before we get into that, let's talk about something that I've started to notice in. Uh, especially translated media, or Japanese media, I should say, is that um, authors are starting to include a normie filter. Now, to define what I'm talking about a normie filter, it's that it's, it includes an event that of, of, of a really, really, really terrible nature just to warn everyone else that whatever the book is to follow will have at least this in it. But sometimes, as I've noticed with, like, Goblin Slayer, the, uh, the event is only used once in order to establish the threat that this is, this is exactly what you're going to see for the rest of the, the, uh, the series, and then they just gloss over it, over the uh, specific event. And in that case, I'm, in Goblin Slayer, the filter was rape. Yeah. It admittedly got rid of a lot of people that would have just complained further down the road about shit that's not important, like the fact that n none of the characters have names, mm -hmm. that uh, the female characters are basically their job. Oh, this is Cowgirl. This is Guild Girl. This is Cleric Girl. This is... No, no. Is she Priestess Girl? It's Priestess. Uh, High Elf Archer. Um, young Priestess. Or, or Amateur Priestess. I, I can't remember what the uh, the rookie one is. But the point is, is to establish a, a an event that is so traumatic that it uh, that it drives off people that wouldn't wouldn't uh, be the target target audience, and uh, and it seems to be working out pretty wonderfully in a number of oh, books. Because oh, it did fucking wonders for Shield Hero. It did wonders for Shield Hero. Um, um, uh, so many people quit after that first episode because the concept that a woman would lie. For personal, political, or financial gain about something like rape is unfathomable, and therefore we should stop watching the show right away, mm -hmm. and instead finding out that, yes, women are people too, and therefore just as capable of evil, and eventually justice needs to be meted out. Mm -hmm. You know, no, nobody talked about that. It was all the people bitching about the first episode, people bitching about slavery, which was the second episode, and that was getting rid of the rest of them. Mm -hmm. And then all anyone wanted to talk about after that was how amazing S.H.I.E.L.D. Hero is and how fucking amazing it was uh, during, I think it was episode 23. Mm -hmm. Anyone, you know, everybody who watched the show knows what happened then. Ah, uh, sweet justice. Absolute Un justice. Unfortunately, we do not live in a just climate. So... Raptor, have you ever encountered that sort of thing in in your books, where somebody, where there's just this like one really, really traumatic event to drive off off uh, off the squeamish? Uh, I I can't think of anything in like the books that I've read for this show, but I I've definitely seen that in like video games and whatnot. Um, the one that comes to mind is probably Call of Duty: Modern Warfare 2's No Russian, mm -hmm. where. You know, you're you're going along with gunning down an entire airport worth of civilians, um, and, and that was kind of a normie filter. Because mm -hmm. uh, I do I do remember them complaining a lot about the No Russians yeah. episode, even um, though you can Love skip Love it. Love, 
Muv yeah. Love was that way as well, especially in the anime adaptation Total Eclipse. The tone shift fucking jaw jacks you. It's that hard. Because you go from, like, okay, it's a bunch of girls at school to learn how to drive mechs to a war zone, and they're all dead. Hmm. You've got, like, all of your char- your, your classic school character tropes. Mm-hmm. You're like, okay, the, the, this one's going to be best girl. Holy shit, she's fucking dead. Oh. Oh, my. This is the girl that's, go- you know, going to bring everyone together. Holy shit, she's dead. And then episode, I think... Two starts and it's a completely different cast and a completely different location. Like, holy fucking shit! Yeah, I, I should was, keep watching this. I thought it was gonna be cute girls doing cute things, and that's cute girls dying all over the place. What the hell? Show me more. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. So, when we're talking about the Normie Filter, then from here on in, we're not specifically talking about like we're not trying to glorify the act of rape or any of these events that uh, occur in this fiction because at the end of it all it is fiction you it, you don't have to read from that point on especially if if they, they, if that book is trying to trying to trying to warn you in a sense as uh, a dangerous sign on the road with the covered with skulls is trying to warn you not to go any further you don't yeah, have um... to so yeah, it's just Read not it. for you. What's more, most of the time in these situations, it is never glorified. It is painfully obvious. This is a bad thing that is happening. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I have the best Normie filter. Hmm. Oh? Goosebumps. Reader beware, you're in for a scare. <laughs> I'm just trying to think, because that was a quite a while ago, because... Wow. Oh. Every book had it. Every book had it. They had a real traumatic event in the beginning. Yeah, and then he didn't. I don't think R.L. Stein knows how to end a book, to be honest. Uh, no, but he also hates children, which is amazing. Mm-hmm. I remember. I want to make the... a career of of, <laughs> of writing books just so I could hate children too. The stories he wrote got better when he was doing Ghosts of Fear Street because then he's just literally doing whatever he wants. Mm-hmm. Um, Instead of trying to keep it for PG thirteen ish. Yeah. Even then, it was really weird. Where uh, was like how to be a vampire, and uh, there's some goofy shit there. But I remember the book that he did about the fucking uh, the mud golems attacking people. Um, they ran into a fucking nerd, and the nerd talked them to death. <laughs> they dried out and died. Amazing. <laughs> okay, well, um. Now that we got that bit of a cleanser so far, I'm going to attempt to sell everyone on a series called Kidnapped to Another World by a man named Naosu R. <laughs> from Japan. Um, and I'm going to make the attempt to do so only using the first 10%. I will provide no spoilers because otherwise you will not be punched in the gut as hard as I am. Cover your eyes, Raptro. Whatever happens, don't open them. <laughs> Okay, so, so if I, okay, so, uh, where do I freaking begin? Let's start at the beginning of the story. It, it opens with a man, uh, a young boy by the who is totally eighteen in high school, his first year of high school, uh, which happens uh, in Japan, because they they refer to their high schools as college. Well, art, well, it's more like, like junior college. college. It's junior college, essentially. So, uh, man, a boy by the name uh, Shun Tanaka. His first name Shun, last name Tanaka. Uh, it book opens up with him trying to study in his homeroom class. We have about 30 students. Uh, our Shun has a cousin that lives with him uh, named Rena, I think her name is. And, uh,. She is a recovering cancer patient, which actually is a becomes a bit of a problem later on. Now, Shun's school has a real big problem with gangs. There are at least three or four gangs in the school at the beginning of the book. Where does he go to school? It's Cromarty High? <laughs> it seems like it, because... Uh, 
Um, apparently, in his in junior in well the previous high school, the uh, the junior high school, I think I don't know what they what they call it. Um, he got stabbed <coughs> by a uh, student, and uh, his dad managed to. St- uh, spooked the school into keeping the student off of charges because nobody could prove anything happened other than the fact that he got shivved. So, our man is... He must have, like, fell on a knife and it, like, <laughs> pierced his body? Mm-hmm. So our, our boy is kind of a cynic. Now, the... It, it's in the morning, so every, all the morning classes are about to begin, and um, all of a sudden, the ground starts to shake. Um, they think it's an earthquake. They're like, okay, just get under your desks. But the, it it just keeps going. It just goes on, and then there's, there's complete darkness outside. Um, and then from there, a another student, um, rather than taking a, taking a cover under his desk, is immediately beamed in the head by a bit of concrete and killed. That's in mm-hmm. chapter three. And we're off to a banger of a start. Mm-hmm. Or, no, it's in chapter one. Point is, is that he gets fucking killed. So, they get transported to another world. Everything's dark because, obviously, there's no infrastructure attached to the building. And, uh... There's, there's injuries all over, and, uh... Our man Shun has to go find his cousin. So... He approaches his teacher, who is described as a essentially a porn star, uh, to help him and this one girl named Yumi, who is in love with his cousin, to go rescue his his sister from uh, well, cousin, his sister, for all purposes, of uh, the troops, to go see if uh, she's all right, and she's up on the third floor, because she's about two years older than him. So. There you have to go through these this damaged infrastructure of this school, and there's just cracks everywhere. And um, halfway through the trip up to the the, uh, the third floor, he manages to find himself a uh, a fireman's axe, the only fireman's axe in the entire school, because uh, it used to be in Japan that you could trust uh, kids to have a, a a big metal instrument in a uh, wall just so you could. F- break down doors if you need to and this is important because um as soon as they his little party of this uh yumi girl uh the teacher and himself reach to the third floor the older kids in the gangs have uh murdered one of the teachers and are have taken over the classroom in which rena has 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 lived is has has her class in and um all all the boys that aren't in the gangs they're being beaten to death and there's a big fire in the room it goes very lord of the flies very quickly in this book <laughs> and um so he demands where his cousin is and uh they're terrified of the fact that he's willing to just chop hands because he as soon as he sees someone about to uh, rape a girl he chops his hand off and then he uh threatens even more people to find where his cousin is and it turns out it's one of the leaders of the gangs that was uh rejected by uh rena and uh so they get into a fight he tries fighting him with a with a chair Meanwhile, his rest of his gang is trying to help him. Uh, eventually, it comes to the point where he he hits him with the spike end of the axe and kills him. And he discovers that Reno was in the process of almost being raped. She wasn't raped, though. She was almost raped, so she was like uh, Tori Amos in that regard. Um, so they get her they get her clothes on, and uh, they they try to go downstairs again. Because uh, at this point, they're trying to figure out whether or not they can survive in this wherever the hell they've been taken. Because it's night. It's night time. So they're heading downstairs. And uh, our man Shun has started to gather an even larger party because he's the only one with an axe. And everyone else <laughs> is trying to, you know, f- uh, be safe. 
So they reach the second floor. And then they start looking outside, and people are noticing that there's things coming in. Humanoid things. So they start getting to the first floor, and the windows are starting to get pelted with arrows. All the windows. And then they start seeing that the first year schoolers on the on the on the uh, on the first floor are starting to get kidnapped by fucking orcs. Big pig faced orcs. Now, I don't want to go into the details of the the orc ecology, but it, they do go into the details later. And that was a punch in the gut, especially as re remembering this part, because at this point most of the of the people on the first floor are either being kidnapped or killed because uh, they're the orcs are predator predators for humans, but they're also a parasitic species, and they require human females to uh, procreate. So they. Uh, so Shun and his, his party am now missing a couple men because uh, at least one guy was an idiot. They immediately just make the the decision to flee back to the the upper floors and decide to reinforce a a, a classroom just to uh, just so they would have a fighting chance. Uh, at this point. Um, they struggle to fight to get to the, the third floor, and they look for volunteers. They send a guy out to go tell the second floor the second floor kids to basically fl flee upward as quickly as you can. And uh, they reinforce the roof. They reinforce that the classroom because the roof is the absolute last place they can run. So they build a barricade at a desks. And at this point, a drunken uh, teacher from the shop class has shown up to and doesn't believe that they're in any danger and is wondering why Shun has an axe. Shun says, we're in fucking danger. We got to go to this classroom. Says, okay, fine. We're going to get as many weapons as possible. So they start gathering as many things as they can from the various closets and janitorial stuff to essentially make clubs and spears and pokey things as possible. Yeah. And um, then they prepare for a siege. Uh, at this point, mo some more of the, the students from the second floors are starting to come up. But on their heels is a patrol of orcs. Now, the dialogue in this is a little weird because it's one of those books where it where the crowd talks. But no one's like attributed to the uh, source. It's not. It's never like uh, Shun says or Rania says. It's no. It's just like, uh, uh, oh my God, there's orcs. Oh my God, there is orcs coming up here. What do we do? Oh my God, I don't know what we're gonna do. Shun, save us. And uh, meanwhile, this whole time, everyone is trying to steal his axe, and he doesn't want to let it go because it's it's the only axe as far as they know. <laughs> Let he who grabs this ask, be they worthy, wield the powers of Odin and be embodied by them. <laughs> um, so, and also, combat is brutal, because it, in order, uh, it's not, it's never described as, you, it, the difficulty of combat is described by how many people are dying. So, it's... the orcs chase them into this classroom and they, they, they're trying to fight them through this uh, this little gap that they've made, and uh, they have a couple students using desks as shields, and uh, and uh, they have two two heavy hitters so far. One guy with a real big orc spear, and one with him and uh, Shun, and and he, and everyone else has to more or less. Uh, throw things back at the uh, at the orcs as they're coming in and hold the line. So they handle the orcs pretty well for a little while, uh, only getting injured now and then. And within a couple chapters, about one or two kids die every every other paragraph. So they're holding together pretty well, or. 
I should say, they get injured or killed. This is important, because that's, that's where the next cut fucking punch in the gut comes from. So, the injured get moved to the roof, and everyone else is, is, has to fight. So, they, they're only... They're only... Uh, this is a very grim, dark fucking universe, and because until about after this... After... After this first 10% is when the cheat stills, skills start coming into play. But these are just normal, ordinary high school kids. The only thing they have are maybe judo as the one kid that has uh, has judo training and is armed with the orc spear. And everyone else is just your bog standard high school kid in their last year. So... The orcs, there's fires exchanged between the, the two groups, and they managed to kill a shit ton of orcs. Meanwhile, they're noticing that they're still, they're still kidnapping people out of the, out of the first and second levels of the high school. The people that weren't able to get away. And, uh, they start trying to breach the, uh, the classroom they're in by using trees to clamber up and behind them. So there's somebody smart running these orcs, that they're not just animals. Uh, at the same time, the orcs in the front are starting to pull back. Which means that they're, they're going to do something fucked up soon. And it turns out, it's the orc boss. Now, did you remember when I heard, when I said that the combat is described how brutally how people get maimed and hurt? Yeah. Every, every action that this orc takes, three or four students die. Dude, that's like fighting fucking Cthulhu in, like, the, the D20 version of Call of Cthulhu. Every fucking turn he just kills, like, 1D4 uh, players. 1D6. So you need at least seven investigators to hopefully throw, a, like, a brick of something in his face. <laughs> that's even worse. I thought it was a D4. I must have updated the rules since. So, um... Shit. So... People are getting fucking wasted by this goddamn creature. <laughs> and of course, um, he's he's immediately going towards uh, the the uh, hot porn star body teacher and his cousin. So he flips the fuck up, and our man Shun goes and fights the damn thing. He manages to wound it, and at the, this point, he manages to keep the orc from killing three, four people. Uh, and at, at the... I, 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 I'm sorry, I need to interrupt because this is just so dark. We, we need some kind of levity here. Mm. Orc, if we do not fight, they will kill us both. Dun 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 <laughs> Continue. So he's finding this work because there's, he's so fixated on kidnapping uh, his teacher. I, 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 I don't remember her fucking name. Uh, da, 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 da. Her, her name is Boobs McKenzie. Asakura. Her, his, her name is Asakura, and her, the teacher's name is Asakura, and his sister's name is Rena. Like Asa so, Akira, the, 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 the actual porn star? Asakura. Uh, so, I, I know what you said, but that sounds like the name of an actual porn star. You know what? <laughs> That's probably where he got the name from then. Asa Asakira. It's a Asa Akira. So anyway, he's he's fixated on kidnapping Asakira for you know, orc ecology reasons. At this time the the shop teacher arrives to with a bundle of flaming something in his hand. He made an IRA bomb, and he charges the orc with it. At this point, he blows himself up, kills the orc boss, and everyone's knocked out. That's how big the fucking bomb was, but it kills the orc. Um, and it's at this point, with the death of the uh, orc boss, that the cheat skills start being activated. And there's only two people that can read it. Not Shun, some other guy named... Uh, Yuki and uh, another little another little lady out of a school of 900 students 
By the end of the first day, there's only 97 of them alive, as far as they can tell. 97 left to go. By the... okay. Well, I didn't say there's going to be any spoilers, but it's... Uh, I'm not going to I'm not going to go further than that. Yeah, so this book fucking rustled your Jimmy something fierce. Yeah, it sounds like it. Uh, part of Shun's cheat skill comes from the orc's loot, and it's a box that ha it's basically a box of holding. It has a secret to it that is uh, that if anybody knew about it, it would cost him his life because they would kill the ki kill him to have it. It's bad enough that it's it's a box of holding that can hold 40 of whatever you want inside of it. But. That said, okay, it is it, a It'll just book. hold 40 things regardless of volume? Just 40 things? Mm-hmm. 40 things regardless of volume. Okay. That's... Or, no, wait, no, it's described as it, it, certain objects make up, uh, take up more squares. So it's it's it was thought up a little bit better, but uh. but the secret is another punch in the gut. This whole book is one punch in the gut every other chapter, and I solely recommend it on that that regard. In that, if you like a book that punches you in the gut every now and again, to uh, go deal, to read this, because uh, holy shit, it will punch you in the gut. Especially when they describe orc ecology and, um... The breeding pit is... It, that one sets you off, like, really hard. Like, yeah. You, you really needed somebody to talk to about that. And, I, uh, I couldn't let that one go. I, I, I couldn't. Because, um... The normally filter was just enough to keep me going. I knew I was, I, I knew what to expect from this, but I wasn't expecting that. So, I, I wholly recommend that fucking book. You can find it on Amazon for about a buck. <laughs> the question is, do you, do you want to? Mm. That's, holy shit, I, I, I'm struggling to find some way to bring levity to that description. That... That's fucking rough. Yeah, that's almost like a full-on, like, horror isekai, or like, existential dread isekai. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It does get better because Shun... Okay, so I will give hope to people, in the form of a big few spoilers. Shun does get the only instance of of a good soul's a, a good soul's cheat skill. And that he's the only one in the, in the in the whole world that is known to be able to heal. Oh, so so he gets an Estus flask. Kind of. Well, no, no, no. He doesn't. Re he he can regenerate himself, yes, but he can heal other people. That's yeah. the only people that can. He, he, that's the only skill he really gets at the start. That gives anybody hope after that point. And there's something about this the the world that he that exists that makes people awful. And it, it just, people being awful seems to be, like, the whole theme of this book, because, uh, they start going crazy, crazy with, uh, with, uh, whatever little power that they have, and uh, it kind of fully explains why they, uh, they went Lord of the Flies so early on. Hey, could this be, like, some, some Dark Souls fan fiction? It is very grim dark at the start, but it slowly, slowly goes towards noble dark. Very slowly. But it 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 will punch you in the gut every fucking step of the way towards noble dark. So that's as much as I want to focus on that book for right now. That's so, all I have to say about that. Javier. Right. Your book. What was it, Ari Fiera? Uh, uh, Ari yeah. Fereda, from commonplace to world strongest. Um, I, I was initially attracted to this book based on the premise of the rather than a, a protagonist or a protagonist and his hapless friends getting isekai'd, it's actually an entire full classroom. Mm-hmm. 
And I'm like, okay, I haven't seen that before. And then, of course, Mike shows up with the whole fucking school. I'm like, well, shit, I can't beat that, can I? <laughs> the whole school gets uh, isekai'd. The, the, the only major difference here is that, unlike other isekai, where in everyone's personality is tropey as fuck, this, for the most part, they seem like real people. And there's a lot of fucking personalities there. Mm-hmm. Naturally, they were summoned to fight the fucking demon lord or the demon lord, a demon army that's planning to come up and wipe out the humans. And they've been summoned as emissaries of God. So they've all been given like stats, job classes with abilities, uh, enhanced growth, and uh, and cheat sk- a variety of different cheat skills. Uh, one of which, the most popular kid in school, his name is Koki. Um, he's uh, basically given the job class hero. So he gets, uh, so the na- the nation gives him, like, from the uh, National Treasury, fucking holy relics. He gets a holy sword, enchanted armor, and everyone is basically given shit that works for their job class. And they find this out by uh, focusing mana into these magical plates that fill out with their personal information and uh, an approximation of their stats. Mm-hmm. And how this works is your your level doesn't make your stats. Your stats actually make your level. And the idea being that the level cap is 100. Um... As your stats increase, your level adjusts to show you how close you are to your full potential. Hmm. Everyone gets combat jobs except for our protagonist, who gets a crafting job, Synergist, which is used for crafting and blacksmithery. And he is bummed out. You see, he's actually kind of the punching bag of the entire class, Mm -hmm. because... He shows up to school to go to sleep because it turns out his dad is actually a well-known game designer and he's always helping his dad with shit and his mom is a manga con and he acts as her assistant when he's not helping his dad. So basically he's kind of got his career prospects already figured out for him so he's not... He, he's going to high school as a formality. Which is... It, hmm. And it pisses all everyone else off because they think that... Uh, He's too good for them. He's too good for them, or that uh, he's not taking shit seriously and he's a good for nothing. Well, this on top of the fact the cutest girl in school is always coming over to talk to him because she's always pushing to bring him into the conversation. Mm -hmm. Offering to share lunch with him because he shows up, he's got some sort of gelatinous snack, he downs in three seconds... So that he gets his, you know, protein intake for the day and then goes back to sleep. And uh, basically everybody is always shit talking him. And he comes, once he travels to this other world, he's like, okay, maybe things will be different here. He has the lowest stats of everyone in his class. And they are bullying the shit out of him. Doing that thing where, hey, come over here, we're going to talk to you over in this dark corner where there are no cameras. And just start, you know, punching the shit out of him and throwing fucking attack spells at him. They're just bullying the shit out of him. Well, they decide to go and do a dungeon crawl. Mm -hmm. At this uh, uh, legendary labyrinth that's, like, just south of the capital. And it's supposed to be a hundred floors deep. The deepest anyone has ever gone in the history of the nation is floor 65. And it's been like 200 years since somebody's gotten that deep. And there's, there's no gimmick here. They're, like, the floors don't change every day. It's, it's just dangerous. It's just dangerous because the mobs all respawn. So it's all well mapped. Um, they go in there and they're getting, uh, they're doing fairly well with some basic training. He's actually gone to the library, studied up on the country... And started trying to think outside the box. He's like, he's got one skill called Transmute. So he can use that to make stuff, but he can also pull ores and minerals completely out of rock. See, that's useful as shit. 
So he starts taking outside the box, and now he can make pitfalls. And all, all the knights that thought he was just going to be fucking dead weight are actually super impressed because they never thought of that. He's making pitfalls, and then because he, he can't really form spikes sharp enough to kill the monsters, he can form enough to keep them, you know, held still so he can just sit there and stab the shit out of them. So he's still getting killed, but, you know, his uh, experience points for killing. Um, he's still getting experience. He's doing all right. Um, our, our fucking uh, uh, legendary hero accidentally throws an ultimate skill that damn near brings the cavern down, and uh, they yell at him for it. He's got an overbearing sense of justice, you know, like, like always like, you know, we must always do what's right because it's the right thing to do. You know, the, the kind of attitude that's going to get people killed. Mm -hmm. In fact, when they showed up in the world, they said, you've been summoned here to fight the demon lord. He's the one that said, okay. And then rallied the entire class behind him to fight the demon lord. Their teacher who is there, and she's one of those... um uh, mid twenties teachers that has a small body, so everyone thinks she's a kid. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, is like begging, no, you, you can't do this. You, you have no idea what you're talking about. But it's too late, you know. The fucking pope of the local re religion has already convinced everybody. Yeah, let's go fight the demon lord. That'll be fun. Mm -hmm. Well, um, one of them triggers a trap. And it teleports them all to the 60th floor. Oh, no. And a fucking monster shows up and uh, an endless spawning mob of skeletons. And they're like all on a bridge. Isn't isn't the big monster that shows up the behemoth? Yeah, the behemoth. Yeah. And um, they throw everything they have at it. And it all it does is make it pause. They don't even scratch it. Um, everyone's, you know, their formation's falling apart, morale's falling apart, um, somebody's about to get killed. But our weak-ass protagonist manages to pull shit together, and he's like, hey, you know, you got, you asshole, and he's talking to their fucking, uh, Koki, he's like, you need to go over there and rally people, what? You're their fucking leader, dude, they need you. Get, quit fucking around with this monster and go lead them. Yes, but the monster is here. We must stop it. We can't let it get away. <sighs> Fuck you. I'll do it myself. And um, he starts helping people with his fucking transmute skill by, like, transmuting a ramp underneath um, some of the skeletons so they all just slide off of the fucking cliff. And that is enough to get people to start coming together and rallying. And... Um, Eventually, he's in a position where he, t he tells the Knight Commander, Hey, I've got a plan. We can get everybody out of here, but um, I'm going to need you to do some shit so I can get out of here when we're done. You can have faith in me, little one. We've got this. And his plan is he gets on the behemoth's head and transmutes it into the fucking rock. Uh, he's going to fight it and try and break out, and it's very capable of doing it, but he's just going to sit there and... You know, just chug mana potions and mana items and keep transmuting it deeper and deeper into the rock. And the idea is, this means that everyone only has to worry about the skeletons. They can then, you know, head towards the fucking exit. And once they've all grouped up, they're supposed to shoot uh, off attack magic like an artillery line. Uh, to clear the way so he can get out. Hmm. Well, later, earlier, that earlier... Let's say a day earlier, uh, the cutest girl in school went to his room in an, a really, really uh, sexy negligee, according to the book, and try, had a moment with him. He's not interested in her at all. No? At all. Wow. And she doesn't realize that she's interested in him. And she had a bad feeling. He's like, uh, you know, I got a bad feeling about this. And he says, sir, you always say that, Frost. You always say you got a bad feeling about this drop. And um, basically, he does like, well, then uh, you protect me. And that'll make you feel better, right? Sure, okay. And then she leaves. But somebody was watching. Somebody that doesn't like what he saw. So as he's sitting there, 
making a fucking break for it as the behemoths break breaking free while they're firing off the artillery to let him uh, uh, get away. A stray fireball leaves the rest of them and smashes him right in the face, exploding and throwing him back. So he falls into the pit with uh, the behemoth. That's probably not good for the behemoth. No, it's not. What's more is that um, the entire class afterwards basically realizes that one of them accidentally killed their classmate and they just un... Without talking to each other about it, they subconsciously all agree just to not talk about it or deal with it because that means that someone there is a fucking murderer. Even if it's by accident. Mm-hmm. Uh... Cute girl in class has a uh, fucking psychotic breakdown because this is exactly what she thought was gonna, you know, thought was gonna happen, and now he's dead. And they basically said that you need to give up on him because uh, we have no idea if he survived the fall. He's at the bottom of the f- okay. He's at the bottom of the abyss, and uh, there's fucking like high level monsters everywhere. He's basically like I think four one hundred. Mm-hmm. Of this 100 floor uh, super dungeon. And everything there is trying to kill him. At one point, a fucking, like, a, a cross between, like, a badger and a bear shows up and bites his fucking arm off. Nice. And he's struggling to get away. He's using transmute to dig, like, a tunnel in the rocks where it can't reach him. Mm-hmm. And eventually he runs out of mana and he passes out. Uh, he wakes up and there's a substance dripping into his mouth and he doesn't know what it is, but he's surrounded by enough blood. He's like, did I fucking bleed out? How the fuck am I still alive? The human body only holds so much blood and I think this is all of it. Well, transmitting a little bit further, he finds this big fucking rock that uh, he would later call uh, find out called a divinity stone. It just... All it does is it just soaks up mana and stores it. And it's actually been out, you know, dripping out this substance uh, that called Ambrosia, which is basically like the ultimate healing potion. It cannot regrow limbs, but it will heal most injuries. So our man's has been drinking this unconsciously for however long he's been out. Um... He's basically, he basically subsided on it for about two and a half weeks until... Because st- uh, he was convinced that, you know, he was just going to starve to death. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was, he was subsiding on that until finally uh, the starvation madness got to him. And he decided, no, 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 we're, we ain't going out like this. So he goes and he hunts some fucking wolves. And um, they're too powerful for him, obviously. But he's like... Um, he also learned that this shit will restore his mana, mm-hmm. so he just basically just sat there transmuting the same spot 24-7 while just ch- chugging a little bit of this to refill his mana until he got so good at it that he started getting derivative skills. Because that's how your skills work here, is you do them enough, and um, obviously you get better, but you also get new skills that are in the tree. So he makes some pits, you know, traps the wolves down there and fucking kills them and brings back fucking right, starts munching raw wolf meat. Then he starts fucking dying horribly because as it turns out, monster meat is horribly poisonous to anything that tries to eat it. Uh, so he downs some ambrosia and he's basically begging something to come from somewhere and put him out of his fucking misery because the pain is that intense. And they then describe it as thus. When you exercise and you tear your muscle, the muscle heals tougher than it was before to overcompensate. So in the process of the monster meat killing him and the ambrosia trying to heal him, um, it basically tore his body apart, put it back together enough times that it forced an evolutionary change in his body. Oh, no. Uh, his His hair is white. His eyes are now red. Uh, he's got, like, a protagonist look about him now. Uh, he grew, like, 15 whole centimeters. Um, he also gained the skill Iron Stomach, 
which allows him to basically eat monster meat. But he also gained an ability from the wolves, which is to project electric fields. And he learns that now every time he eats a monster, uh, he can gain like unique skills from them. That sounds like it'd be uh, that'd be beneficial. So he basically becomes the predator of the uh, of the labyrinth, just stalking the floor, hunting shit, eating it, taking their fucking skills. Uh, he fights the fucking badger bear. He unintentionally like rips its arm off and starts eating it in front of him just as a big fuck you. Which is what you do. Um, but his transmutation also gives him like a, a praise and ore sense. If he finds a new ore, he instantly knows what it is and how it works and all of its properties. So he finds this uh, ore called Blast Rock, which uh, he runs it through his head enough times to realize if I find, you know, if I file this down into a powder, it's gunpowder. So he transmutes a fucking gun. <laughs> He basically assembles from scratch a fucking gun from the, if, the toughest material he can find. Oh, and the barrel is such that when he channels his electric field through it, not only is it a fucking, you know, a projectile, normal uh, chemical projectile, it's also a fucking railgun. It, doesn't it also look like a fucking Dirty Harry revolver, from what I remember? Uh, it, look, it, it looks like a combination between that and a, a gun from Trigun. Okay. Like it, it, it looks like a fancy sci-fi revolver. Uh, if, if I had to... Kind of like a hand cannon from Destiny. So he starts going through... He can't go up. There's no stairs up. So he has to go down. Comes to find out the 100 floor super dungeon is actually 200 floors. And in the process, he eats a bunch of fucking monsters. Uh, he gains a bunch of fucking abilities. Uh, he builds an anti-material rifle that he fucking one-arms. Because that's what and, you do when you're forced into the worst fucking situation possible. Uh, uh, he meets a vampire lolly princess who's been trapped down there for 300 years, and they fucking team up to get out of the fucking dungeon. And eventually, they, they do, and it's like the toughest fucking fight he's, uh, he's been through. Like, he's like the ultimate fucking predator of the labyrinth, and the, the, the final boss of the labyrinth fucking wrecks him hard. To the point where one of his eyes is melted in the eye socket. So where the ambrosia is not going to fix it. Mm -hmm. And um, come to find out the entire labyrinth was a test. And for passing the test, they are granted the boon of creation magic. Which is a lost art that nobody remembers. All the, spe the, the sacred artifacts that have like magic built into them and crazy shit. Nobody knows how to make those anymore. Those are all, like, leftovers from the quote-unquote time of gods. He knows how to make that shit now. Oh, no. Yeah. So, um, he makes himself a, a robot arm. Because he can do that now. Mm -hmm. Because there's nothing saying he can't. Uh, he takes the Divinity Stone, which is now, like, he sucked that thing dry. Because just Every floor he would fight and then just you know, drink a bunch of this ambrosia. Uh, he, he turned it in, because they could store mana, he turned them into fucking uh, jewelry that as your mana naturally regens, it's going to fill these up so they act as like backup mana sources. But he also made a fake eye and now he can see the flow of mana, he can see the cores of spells. He builds a second revolver. He names all his shit, like, German names. His pistols are named Donner and Schlag. Uh, his anti-material rifle is Schlagen. Uh, he builds a motorcycle and a fucking Hummer. And come to find out that there are... He doesn't care about the world anymore. Because, you know, he was betrayed. Fuck this world. Mm -hmm. He doesn't give a shit about them. Uh, so he wants to go home. And he's convinced that somewhere in this world is the way to get home. Because the Pope basically said... Yeah, once you beat the demons, then surely God will send you home. That's not a guarantee. It's not a guarantee. So, um, he and the Lolly Vampire Princess decide that they're going to go around, because there's seven labyrinths in this world, made by these seven guys that were fighting against the gods, because the gods are fucking assholes, as it turns out. 
Uh, basically, this huge fucking war of extermination the demons got going against the humans. It's the gods just playing a game for funsies. And they do this every couple hundred years. Just all of a sudden, a race that what was wasn't doing anything to nobody. All of a sudden, there's a war of subjugation and extermination on them. Wiped out the fucking dragon men. Uh, all sorts of other crazy shit. Wiped out the vampires. Hmm. Um. Oh, and um, our protagonist very much is. Uh, I, I like this girl. But it's really weird because she's like 300 plus years old, but she looks like she's like 14 or 13. And because uh, she's got a fucking uh, ageless body. And he's doing that weird thing like, I, I like her, but it would, what would people say to me? Uh, she fixes that for him by just uh, mounting him and just taking the, uh, taking the dick. She's not waiting for that D, she's taking the D. Mm hmm. And now their uh, their sex life is very much um, described as every time they get a free moment, they're going at it. Nice. Uh, so of course he meets a, and that's kind of where, where the story goes. Uh, um, shenanigans ensue. Uh, he pulls out fucking high tech weaponry that he's developed with uh, the magic he's been given uh, to solve all his problems. Um, and it, some things of it get, like, so in, insane later on. Uh, he meets this fucking dragon, and because he heard a story that the, the dragon race, uh, they were so armored, the only, the, there were only two soft spots on their whole body. It was, like, the, the inside of their mouths and the eyes uh, and their anuses. So uh, he, he pulls out a fucking pile bunker uh, out of his fucking... Uh, uh, it's a, a ring of holding. It's basically just a clo uh, extra dimensional space generated by a ring that holds all his shit. Mm -hmm. And um, the dragon wiggles free uh, before he can fire off the fucking uh, uh, the rod. So he grabs uh, the dragon's like kind of like down, like catching its breath, and he goes and he shoves it up the dragon's ass. He starts smashing it in there. And all of a sudden, the dragon's, like, begging it, please stop, please don't do that, no, 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 please, please, please don't. Come to find out that, um, the dragon is a woman. Oh. And, uh, the dragon was actually being mind-controlled when they were fighting it. And, uh, the dragon is almost out of a mana and is about to assume her humanoid form. Please take out the fucking pile out or I'm gonna fucking die. Uh, Lolly Vampire says, it it's okay, you could pull it out. So he just kicks this some bitch out in one motion. Is not gentle about it at all. So when the dragon reverts to her humanoid form, and she's like, milf sexy. Mm -hmm. Like, just a hot-ass milf. Now she's a super fucking perv, because she had no idea, you know, the ecstasy that abuse like that uh, could bring to a person. And slowly he's building a fucking harem of weirdos. Nice. And he's constantly telling them, like, uh, I'm not interested. He's got this fucking big titty uh, uh, rabbit girl hanging out, you know, clinging on to him. And he's telling her, uh, I'm not interested. He's actually used her as bait before by throwing her to monsters. Because her body is, like, so, like, nearly invulnerable because of uh, uh, an ability she has. Mm -hmm. And it's... The anime adaptation did come out, and I've seen clips from it and episodes from it, and it does not do the book justice. Hmm. Well, it can't be helped, I guess. Um, I, I, I fully recommend this thing. Mm -hmm. um, just because there are so many scenes in there that are just so fucking funny. Like, the fact that he, he becomes Big Boss at one point, training the fucking rabbit men into fucking elite uh, assassin commandos. Oh, brutal. So well, their their leader gets captured at one point, and they they overhear him being tortured, and you know he's fucking taunting the people torturing him. And he's like, "You call that a punch? Put your fucking back into it, you pussy!" To the point where where the torturers feel weird about torturing him. That's the only way you can get you you can handle it. Uh, if, if, from what I found. 
is that you, you gotta make them feel weird for doing this, not 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 you. So, with that uh, bit of a uh, palate cleanser, uh, Raptro, what the hell happened to you? What did you read? Batsuri san de musu shitatara mote mote ni narimashita. Uh, didn't get a proper English translation of the title, so I had to get it myself. Uh, my harem is of semi-human girls. Uh, oh, uh, they, oh, no. they never gave me a fucking translation of the title. I only figured it out after I had, uh... I, you know what? I read all 31 chapters that are out currently, uh, because it is manga, and I thought it would get better. It didn't. Oh. Um... This is like Mon Musu, but worse? Uh, sort of. I, I, I would say considerably a lot worse. Um, so, it, it, we, we don't get an explanation of why our protagonist is picked to go to another world, but they are. Um, their cheat skill is that they're amazing at everything. Um, oh, their cheat skill. oh, no. <laughs> yeah. And immediately, uh, he's attacked by thieves beats all of them, leaves them alive, but they're all animal girls. Um, so the dog girl that's part of the group pisses herself and then pledges loyalty. I really want people to stop suggesting things to me where people piss themselves. <laughs> what, do you, um, what do you think they're trying to say? I don't know. But, uh, yeah, so it, it continues on. Um, he goes on a few like minor adventures. Uh, there's one where they, they're they traveling, like, a labyrinth, and they fight a bunch of chimera, and he meets, like, uh, he, he kills a bunch of, like, soldier ants that are, like, rank D enemies that somebody, like, who just joined the guild shouldn't be able to beat, so they're like, oh, well, we have to test your skills, so he fights against the little lolly dog girl that runs the guild, and because he beats her so resoundingly, she's like, okay, you're my husband now. And Does she pee on him? Yes. Ah, you're in luck. Uh, so, uh, it, and at this point, sex hasn't happened, right? It's been implied, and immediately after this, it's like, okay, there's sex every chapter, there's nudity every chapter. Um, and it, it, it just keeps escalating and escalating. He goes, he fights an ant queen um, with the little lolly dog girl, uh, beheads it, and then the ant queen's like, oh, well, I want you to take care of my daughter. And so then he transmutes the beheaded ant queen's head into her daughter? Bug and pussy! It, it, yes, actually. <laughs> uh, newborn... <laughs> well, wait, bug pussy. I hate that these words are coming out of my mouth. Um, but so, so the ant princess thinks of him both as a dad and her husband. He is now queen of the ant women, who are all just women with ant antennae. Yeah. Um. He it, it keeps going forward. He there's a couple of bunny girls that run a shop, and it's just like, uh, they fight sky pirates. They open a maid cafe. It's just. <laughs> yeah. The, these these are the highlights. By the way, everything else is just sex. Um, oh lord. <laughs> It's like and, a porn parody of Final Fantasy XII, you mm -hmm. know? You do I, this, you go fight some sky pirates, it's very... There's not a lot of focus. Yeah, it, re, not a lot of focus actually describes a lot of this book. Like, it's not it's not like as garbage as uh, My my House in Another World or whatever the fuck that one was called. <laughs> but this is like purely an excuse to get... This is, you know, borderline pornographic because of all the censors. Um, but you do see a lot of titties. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and then, uh, as far as like chapter 31 has come out, it's called happy ending. Um, he, uh, he, by, by this point he has a harem of like 16 different fucking, uh, semi or demi human girls or whatever. There's a succubus, there's the rabbit girls, there's a dog girl, there's two cat girls. <laughs> Does he call his bedroom the San Diego Zoo? <laughs> I, no, 
Yeah, that would have actually been a decent joke. Uh, that there, there's no decent jokes in this, by the way, or at least not in the uh, translated manga. Uh, I really don't recommend this. I really, really don't recommend this. Hmm. Um, I, I, I said before, like the person who, who, uh, recommended this to me, at, was at one point in my life a friend, and now they are an acquaintance. Um. And you don't trust acquaintances for books. Yeah, I don't trust acquaintances for recommendations. <laughs> um, I made I made this joke earlier, but I'm gonna make it again. Ah, you're looking for books about going, you know, isekai. Well, you're in luck. <sighs> yeah. the The biggest conflict the protagonist in this faces is the moral dilemma of. Is it okay to keep having sex with all of these demi human girls and marry them all? That is it. There is no like, this is rough, I'm getting my ass kicked. It is just. Is it okay to get married to like 16 women? Nice. He has, he has no intentions of going back to his world. He doesn't give a shit, right? He is getting strange animal fuzz. <laughs> on the other side. It is. It, it, I, I, I opened a chapter while reading this. Uh, one of the later chapters. Uh, I think it's yeah, chapter twenty-seven, wife or mistress. Mm. Right. Yeah. Uh, I'm. i We're gonna do this live. I'm gonna count how many sex scenes are in this. Just, just this one chapter alone. Just, just this one chapter alone. Relatively late, right? Uh, one, two, three, four, five. Five in a single chapter. Amazing. Uh, so, uh, then, so, what was this book called? Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but Suri San, Demusu, Shitsutara, Modi Modi, whatever, fuck. Uh, yeah, so he's like, oh my god, I don't even... I, I fuck. I'm gonna count the wives, because it gives us a nice little. Uh, yeah. T title will be in the description. Yeah. Uh. <sighs> all right. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve wives. And however many mistresses he has, good lord. Good yeah. Lord. Uh. So one dog girl, two cat girls, ant girl, uh, two bunny girls. I'm guessing two more... Oh, they're wolf girls. Okay. Uh, one harpy, one succubus. I'm guessing that's another cat girl. And then a lizard girl. One if by land, two if by sea. <laughs> yeah. So it, it really is just... Like, if you're horny on main, this book's for you. If you're just, you know, a regular functioning human being... Uh, go look at actual porn. I was saying, because it seems to be like, there's better Monster Girl porn out there than this, yeah. the sounds of it. Yeah, like, Mon, Mon Muzu actually, like, teases shit. This is just, like, porn oh. for the sake of porn. I was saying, because Mon Musu, the, the characters are the draw, because they're all endearing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're all waifus. This is all, this is all, like, um, god, what is that, that one thing with all the, the animal girls in, like, the forest, and, like, he, the kid is, like, traveling. Monster Girl Quest? No. Uh -huh. It's not porn. Uh, it's the one where that penguin got, like, really attached to the anime penguin girl. Oh, Kimono Friends. Yeah. Th that, basically, this is, like, Kimono Friends, but etchier. Like, what if, what if you could theoretically fuck the jackal? That, that is, that is what this is. Uh, that's what that's what Dan Boru is for. Yeah. Or Gelboru. <laughs> so, it is... Eh. It is, uh, yeah, something to leave the flicking episode on. So, yeah. anyway, we have uh, Kidnap to Another World, Eri Ferreira, and, uh, oh boy, what our poor man's rapture got thrown into. Um, I'm thinking 
we've done a lot of Eastern Isekai mm -hmm. uh, last couple weeks. I mean, uh, hell, you, I think it's funny that Ari Freda turned into uh, Metal Mage, mm -hmm. which I think is uh, hilarious. Let's uh, let's do some Western stuff. Yeah. Um, I got a couple things in mind. Um, either see you know, some uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs or some uh, Heinlein or some uh, Asimov. I'll continue as I am with uh, looking on Kindle stuff. So I will talk about God of Magic. That one was interesting. Um, and then Retro, my poor bands. Poor band. I don't know. Hmm. We'll figure something I, out for you. I I guess I'll I'll find something worse to read. <laughs> um, well, you, you can find something to watch. Oh yeah, sure. If if, 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 it, if it only has like a, a TV adaptation or. A, movie or an anime adaptation or if it's just like a comic book yeah i mean uh, as long as it fits the theme right yeah, yeah sure. so this was an episode of degaruda uh thank you for watching and these are your hosts uh xavier Repcho, and me uh see you until another fortnight ish later oh. all right i love fortnight oh god <laughs>